Quick, why should you even trust this video and not one of the hundreds of others out there? Well, number one, we're not selling you a 1000 course like these guys. We're gonna give you some actionable advice that you can actually use, not generic tips like Princeton Review. And number two, practice tests are the way to go. Oftentimes, Kaplan and Princeton Review will sell you questions harder than the actual SAT to get you worried and make you spend even more money on their SAT tutoring. And three, we're actually seniors who took standardized tests this year and last year. My name is Rishab Jain. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and I'm attending Harvard College this fall. And my name is Okay Zoyne Bell, and I had a near-perfect score on the SAT, and I'm attending Stanford this fall. I barely prepped for the SAT, honestly. I only did a couple of practice tests and a couple hours of studying, and I was able to get a score that got me into Stanford. All right, and so without further ado, we're going to teach you how to ace the SAT without being a genius, without dropping $1,000 on a course, and not spending hundreds of hours. We truly believe in this idea of working smarter, not harder. And so I'll let OK's Way start with this first secret. Yeah, this is one of the biggest tips that I used on the SAT to get me almost to 1600. So the first one is the circling secret. A lot of times SAT tutors will tell you, hey, you can skip a question and then you can come back to it later. But in my opinion, never skip questions. Instead, put a placeholder answer and circle the question afterward. That way, if you run out of time on the end of the test, you're not there with a bunch of empty bubbles and you don't have to go back and start frantically filling them in because you would have had the time to put in an educated guess. Even beyond that, you really want to be able to circle your questions. So that way, when you're reviewing through the questions, you'll know exactly which ones you had trouble on and be able to evaluate the educated guess that you put in or decide to put in a completely different answer. This way, you're optimizing for a higher number of questions answered, even the ones that you're unsure about. And you're also making a way for you to go back and look at questions that you're unsure about. So once again, circle, don't skip. But that being said, how do you bubble the answers on the test? Oftentimes, students will answer a question, then head over to their bubble sheet and bubble it in. But this often ends up wasting a lot of time. And it's actually good for you and your brain to focus on the questions first and then bubble things later. So some students like to actually have a strategy that they develop during their prep stages where they'll answer the questions on one or two pages at a time and then transfer all the answers to the bubble sheet after a passage is complete or even after the entire section is complete if you're a high scorer who's able to answer almost all or most of the questions. But that being said, how do you even guess? Uh, for super high scorers like OK's Way, they often don't need to guess on any of the questions, but how do you guess? If you do a random spread where you guess, I don't know, A, B, C, D, and you just keep altering that, studies have actually shown that that doesn't work as good. People have analyzed this and they found that a consistent guessing strategy where you just answer the same uh, letter, for instance, C every single time will result in a higher number of questions being correct. And so I actually recommend choosing the answer choice A just because it's the first one and it'll be easier to bubble. But the SAT is completely digitally generated. The answer choices are digitally generated. So there's a completely random spread. It's not like the a a ACT where you know certain answer choices have a higher percentage than other answer choices. And so there's no point in trying to optimize for that. Just select one choice and guess all the questions you haven't answered yet with that choice. So now when you're guessing and doing things of this nature, how do you actually avoid making spelling mistakes? It might sound interesting because questions that on the SAT that are pegged to, you know, go quickly, like on the language section or on the math no calculator section are actually the highest prone for mistakes, errors that end up just losing you points and dropping your score rapidly. The way I minimize silly mistakes is by first reading through the question thoroughly, especially on the language section and the reading sections. There are often times where wording may not be as it seems if you read through it too quickly and you end up picking the wrong answer, the most attractive or appealing answer that they use to intentionally trick you. It might seem like you're wasting time by going through and reading each question twice or taking more time to read the question for thoroughly once, but you're actually helping yourself by not having to read through it again and also minimizing the chance that you'll make silly mistakes. So as counterintuitive as it sounds, you want to spend more time both reading the instructions and reading out the answer to make sure that you're actually picking the correct option. Beyond that, checking your work right after you do the question is super important. I'm not a huge fan of go through the whole thing and then go through it again to make sure you did all of your answers correctly. 
after you finish a problem or finish a question, check through your work. Just take one minute. Don't second guess. Don't try and optimize for a different answer. Just make sure you circle the right bubble. This also ties into my next tip, which is on how to avoid distractions on the SAT. Surprisingly, this may sound obvious, but you're actually in a room full of people, you know, taking this exam unless you're the only one on SAT day, which is very unlikely. And so distractions are actually a huge part of why students don't score well in the SAT. You begin to second guess yourself, hearing people turn pages faster than you, hearing the proctor say how much time is left, and all of this just infiltrates your headspace. It's really important that you just stay focused on yourself. Don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Don't listen to the outside noise. And also just make sure that once again, you're going over your answers and optimizing for maximum number of questions right. I can't stress this enough. Too many students are so scared about getting questions wrong, not finishing on time, but if you're pacing yourself, you're implementing these tips, chances are you're gonna finish with perfect time. You might even have a bit of time to check it over. And beyond that, you'll have as few mistakes as possible. You know, people talk about get enough sleep and yada, yada, yada. But one of the most important things is that on test day, you're not wasting any time. And the way you'll do that is by minimizing these distractions and not worrying about what other people who are taking the test next to you are doing. Yeah. And I think one of the things to avoid all of those distractions um, is to take a couple of practice tests so you really get the flow of it and you start to get more confident with yourself. But that being said, let's transition into some section specific secrets where Okazway is going to give you some strategies on actual sections. So one of the biggest ways I've been able to tutor my friends from scores like 1330 to 1550 is by helping them on historical reading questions. This is one of the most infamous parts of the SAT because of the elusive and confusing language that you see on the reading section. Well, the first way to really combat this is to read. But, you know, not everyone enjoys reading and not everyone will have the time to make up for all the reading that they missed the day before the SAT. So what you really want to do is just settle down and take a reading section that has some historical context or was written in some sort of old language and go through it. The biggest thing to do is to avoid all of the confusing and difficult prose. Think about reading Shakespeare. You know, there are actually a lot of elements of it that you can clearly understand, but when they're throwing in larger, more jumbled sentence structures and words, it just throws you off and makes it difficult to understand. So one of the first things that you want to do is just start going through the sentences, reading through slowly, but still pacing yourself and just trying to glean as much information from it as possible. Then what you want to do is you want to correlate the question that's being asked with what you're seeing in the passage. If it refers to a specific passage, read through the whole paragraph that the passage is contained in. So if it's referring to, say, sentence 50, read the two sentences before it so that you get some context. Then look at the questions. Oftentimes, the answer in the question, the answers of the questions are often contained within the passage itself. So say for this question, one of the answers limits the king's power. I don't know. I'm just making this up. It's highly likely that some variation of the words limit the king's power is present inside of the passage. And that's the easiest way to get to the answer. Oftentimes, you don't even need to completely understand the passage because the SAT, despite it being branded as a reading comprehension test, there honestly isn't much actual reading analysis present within the test. And so it'll be really easy to just correlate the answers with the question. Next in the reading section is the science passages. I'd say besides the historical context, this is one of the hardest sort of sections on the SAT or types of questions that you're going to see. And one of the biggest things is how do you go from passage to data to answer? A lot of times these science questions will have first a passage, then they'll have some sort of graphic or data, and then they'll finally have the answer. And sometimes what you'll be doing is actually comparing two different scientific opinions. So as you can see in this question, they have a passage one and a passage two. Once again, the answer options are oftentimes always present within the passage. So what you want to do is read through the passage thoroughly so that you can remember content that's inside of it. And make sure you're also looking at the answers at the same time. You know, there's this word to answer to the data pipeline that I keep referencing. And the way that it happens is if you're reading through the passage intentionally, you'll oftentimes see statements that are present within the answer options that are within the passage itself. And then what you can do is you can start eliminating certain answers, ones that you don't find in the passage or ones that you see in a completely different context. Nine times out of 10, 
the wrong answers will just be saying the opposite of what the answer choice is in the past. The next sort of section on the reading section is the associated quote questions. These questions are honestly such a gimme on the SAT, largely because, first of all, the question that precedes it, which is the um, anchor question, is directly correlated with the evidence question. All you have to do is go to that question three or go to that evidence question, read each passage, and then see which, what, which answer appears in the passage. Every single question like this, there will never be a time where one quote will have multiple answers within it. It's always that there's one quote in the evidence question that is a direct quote of one of the answer choices in the anchor question. So these questions are so easy. If anything on the ERBW section, EBRW section, you should not be getting any of these questions wrong because one of the biggest things you can do is just go through the evidence first and figure out which answer in the anchor question appears in the evidence. And this method has been completely infallible. Um, every practice test during the SAT I never encountered an associated quote question that I got wrong. I know for a fact I didn't get any of the reading wrong. And this question in particular, I was so sure of, I was able to blow by these questions because of the fact that you can directly see in every quote that one of the answer choices in the anchor question will be present. And a lot of times the other quotes really don't make any sense in context of the answers in the anchor question. So one of the biggest parts about the associated quote questions is that you don't really even need to understand the passage. You simply just have to search for which pieces of evidence are contained within the quote or which answers in the anchor question are contained within the quote. And once you've found that, you know the answer to both the anchor question and the evidence question, meaning you've gained two extra correct questions on the SAT. So if anything, just practice these questions and use this association technique to figure out the right answers. Now, finally, we have the focus paragraph. This is really interesting because on the EBRW section, we all know that language is generally considered to be much easier than reading. However, language is the one that people really like to go fast on. And if you really want to optimize for that quickness and want to optimize for getting a high number of answers correct while also going quickly on the language section, partially because there is decreased time, what you're going to want to do is bounce around the focus paragraph. So for example, you see here in question 28 that they're asking about if the sentence should be kept or deleted within the larger paragraph. One of the main things you want to do is first read the whole paragraph through, then reference your previous answer. So you want to read the paragraph in the context of the past two answers. So if there's some sort of language mistake that you've corrected, you want to read the paragraph as though the answers that you picked in the past two questions, in this case 26 and 27, have been implemented in the paragraph. This way, the paragraph both reads seamlessly and makes the most sense. And then you'll easily be able to lead up to the answer because you'll have all the language that's preceding the context of the focus paragraph question. Now that you've settled for your 800 in the evidence-based reading and writing section, you want to score that 790 or 800 in the math calculator section. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, navigating the math calculator section by using your calculator. We'll get to the no calculator section in a bit, but this is a huge thing. One of the biggest places people lose points on, besides the reading sections that we covered, is actually the math calculator section. And it's odd because with your calculator, you can virtually solve any of the questions simply by using plug and chug. So this is one of the biggest things. First of all, if you don't know a topic, just use your calculator to plug and chug. And one of the biggest forms of studying that you need to do beforehand when you're looking at the math calculator section is to know your calculator. I recommend buying the NumWorks calculator. It's this amazing electronic calculator. It's actually cheaper than a TI-84, and it gives you all sorts of functionality, and it is SAT approved. You can even download more advanced code on it. You can get it to do functions and all sorts of stuff. It's a great calculator. It's completely SAT approved. You can use it. I'd recommend having a backup calculator in case your proctor stint has never seen the calculator before, but doubt that will happen. It's an amazing calculator, and it will help you a lot for topics that appear if you don't know them. For me, I'm a pretty much a math person, so I didn't, I didn't really encounter topics that were unique or foreign, but I know that's not the case for some people, which is perfectly fine. You can still score well on the SAT if you don't have advanced math experience. One of the first ways is doing plug and chug. Say you encounter a trigonometry problem that you don't know the answer to, just start plugging in numbers. 
say you encounter a word problem that you know you're kind of confused on or you don't know how to go about doing it if you just set up a general function you can start plugging in numbers and eventually you'll encounter an answer especially for math calculator where a majority of the questions are multiple choice you're going to be able to plug in any of the answer choice options and finally get to the right answer this might seem obvious but i know so many students who are discounting the effect and importance of their calculator on this section. Now I know why Okazwe scored so highly on his SAT. Those strategies were really amazing. But let's talk about some strategies you can use before you get into the test center. What is some prep you can do and what are some tips for preparing effectively? So the first way you want to prep is what to study on the math section so that you can breathe through it, particularly on the no calculator section. Firstly, knowing your trigonometric functions is huge. You don't have to rem remember the entire sort of circular table of all the trig functions, but knowing how when you move each degree, how the trig value changes is really important. So just knowing your sine, cosine, and tangent, you don't have to know like arc sine or inverse sine, any of that stuff. I know sometimes these advanced tests that they give you to, you know, scare you into buying their test prep will often ask way more advanced math questions that will be present on the test. Um, so just don't worry about that. All you need to know is sine, cosine, tangent. Next, one of the most important things to study is mental math and simple sort of um, rate over time word problems. These rate over time word problems happen all the time. So all of these algebraic word, problem, word problems are really important to study. This doesn't take much time. You can take an hour or two hours and go through 50 problems, which I guarantee you will encapsulate the pool of problems that College Board likes to pull from. It's things like, if I work one hour and I'm able to complete this much work, and my friend joins me and he's able to do the same amount of work in 30 minutes, how long will it take for us to complete the test together? It's things like, if my car is moving at X miles per hour, how long will it get, take me to get to the top of the mountain, which is X miles long? Just things of that nature that seem pretty simple, but they just require a little bit more of your practice. Chances are, unless you're taking the SAT at a super early age or grade, you're not going to have seen these problems for a while. And so even though you know how to solve them, the nerves plus the fact that you'll be slow due to having a lack of practice on these types of problems, it's what's going to affect you. So it's really important that you just take some quick time to practice this. And this is honestly something I recommend for one or two days before the test because you want it to be fresh in your mind. So let's destigmatize, you know, studying the day before. It's really not that harmful for you as long as you're not doing it at like 2 a.m. in the morning when you've procrastinated all day. If you're doing that at like 12 p.m. the day before your test, it's perfectly fine to, you know, take some time to go over questions that you probably already know the answer to and you just don't want to be rusty for that day before the test. Then the next thing you want to do to breeze through this section is study geometric questions. I can't tell you how many side angle side questions there are on the math no calculator section, how many figure out the size of this angle questions there are on the math no calculator section, how many um, similar sort of polygons or shape questions there are on the math no calculator section. It's really important that you just study those and it's preferable that you have the area and perimeter equations memorized because, you know, you're going to encounter them. I know they're on the SAT sort of cheat sheet that they give you during the test, but it's so much easier not to have to be flipping back and forth. Of course, if you forget something, it's easy to just flip back. So don't place too much emphasis on it. Don't think you have to completely memorize it, but it's just nice to know. And once you practice the problems enough, once again, this can all be done within a day, you'll be good and ready to go. So on the SAT, the sections always appear in the same order and reading always comes first. And that often is difficult because students will walk out of their parents' car being dropped off to the test center with all of those nerves and also just a little bit of grogginess after, you know, sleeping or maybe not getting so much sleep the night before. And so the first thing you see is the reading section, which might have a dense passage at the very front of it. And so you just lose hope and end up getting a lower score than you would have anticipated. And so what I'd recommend is two things. Number one is during your practice, identify the best type of passage for you. So there's going to be some types of natural sciences passage or like okay's way earlier discussed the historical type of passage. And so for me personally, I found that the science types of passages were my strong suit. And so I on my ACT test and whatever SAT prep that I did on the side, I often found that I would always jump 
straight into the natural science passage first. It was the passage that took me the least amount of time because I was the best at it. And it also got all my nerves away because I was working through one section in its entirety, the strongest one for me. In addition, the morning before when you're in the car, or unfortunately, if you have to drive to the test, um, you should try to talk a little bit or hear something like an audio book or read a passage out loud. Um, if you do have the comfort of being driven to your ACT or your SAT test, I would recommend, you know, bringing a book with you or downloading a practice test on your phone and then just reading out the passage out loud and then one in your head that will warm up your brain a little bit just because reading is the very first section on your test. Yeah. And so one big lesson I want to leave with you guys is that getting things wrong is good. It's perfectly fine. Even if you take a practice test the day before, I know I took a practice test the day before and got 12 wrong on ERBW, then the real day got none wrong. And that's actually a pretty rare thing to happen on the SAT. So it's just like, even if you get stuff wrong, don't let it rattle you. You might just be having an off day. If you use these tips, you're going to perform trust me. All right. So being graduating seniors, Okazwe and I have both seen our fellow classmates as well as underclassmen take the SAT tests and other standardized tests. And sometimes we see students, you know, going to prep centers and spending thousands of dollars on a summer course or buying a book from Kaplan or Princeton Review. And while some of these resources are helpful, at the end of the day, what we find is that simply using practice tests is the best way to go. One is because oftentimes the tests that a company like Princeton Review or Kaplan might make aren't the same as the actual SAT. So taking those real tests is the best way to go. And the second thing is in these prep courses, they're just going to make you, you know, understand what your own mistakes are, which using the tips that Okazwe just gave you on this last slide about getting things wrong and then tweaking and improving, you can often do on your own. And so what we'd recommend is using practice tests. And we've compiled a list of practice tests as well as some additional testing resources for you in the description below. Um, I'd really like to thank Okazwe for taking the time to come on today. I really appreciate his help on this video. So make sure to follow him on Instagram. You can check out our Instagram pages in the description below and feel free to use code Okazwe for 50% off the testing resources.